Hi everyone, this is Mrs. Silvestro and we are continuing with The Wild Robot. Today we are going to read chapters 28, 29, and 30. Chapter 28, The Old Goose. Ordinarily, the forest animals would have run away from the monster, but they were awfully curious why she was carrying a hatchling on her shoulder. And once Roz explained the situation, the animals actually tried to help. A frog pointed Roz up to the squirrels, a squirrel recommended that she speak with the magpies, and then a magpie sent them over to the beaver pond. The ground grew soggier, the grass grew taller, and soon the robot and the goslings were look, look, looking across a wide, murky pond. Dragonflies buzzed through the reeds, turtles sunned themselves on a log, schools of small fish gathered in the shadows, and there, floating in the center of the pond, was an old gray goose. A very good morning to you, the robot's friendly voice boomed over the water. I have an adorable little gosling with me. The goose just stared. I am in great need of your assistance, said Ross. Actually, the gosling is in need of your assistance. The goose didn't move. Food, peeped the gosling. Food, food. That tiny voice was more than the old goose could bear, and she began gliding across the pond and squawking to the robot. What are you doing with that hungry hatchling? Where are his parents? There was a terrible accident, said Roz. It was my fault. This gosling is the only survivor. If there was a terrible accident, why does your voice sound so cheerful? The goose flapped her wings. Are you sure you didn't eat his parents? I am sure I did not eat his parents, said Roz, returning to her normal voice. I do not eat anything, including parents. The goose squinted at the robot. Then she said, do you know who his parents were? I do not know. Well, they must have belonged to one of the other flocks on the island because nobody in my flock is missing. Will you take the gosling? I most certainly will not, squawked the goose. I can't take in every orphan I see. You say this is your fault? It seems to me that it's up for to you to make things right. Mama, mama, peeped the gosling. I have tried to tell him that I am not his mother, said the robot, but he does not understand. Well, you'll have to act like his mother if you want him to survive. There was that word again, act. Very slowly, the robot was learning to act friendly. Maybe she could learn to act motherly as well. You do want him to survive, don't you? Said the goose. Yes, I do want him to survive, said the robot. But I do not know how to act like a mother. Oh, it's nothing. You just have to provide the gosling with food and water and shelter. Uh, make him feel loved, but don't pamper him too much. Keep him away from danger and make sure he learns to walk and talk and swim and fly and get along with others and also look after himself. And that's really all there is to motherhood. The robot just stared. Mama, food, said the gosling. Now would probably be a good time to feed your son, said the goose. Yes, of course, said the robot. What should I feed him? Give him some mashed up grass, and if a few insects get in there, all the better. Roz tore several blades of grass from the ground. She mashed them into a ball and dropped the ball into the nest. The gosling shook his tail feathers and chewed his very first bites of food. By the way, my name is Loudwing, said the goose. Everybody already knows your name, Roz. What's the gosling's name? I do not know. The robot looked at her adopted son. What is your name, Gosling? He can't name himself, squawked Loudwing. And then, with a loud burst of wing beats, the goose fluttered up from the pond and landed right on Roz's head. Water streamed down the robot's dusty body as Loudwing leaned over the nest. Oh dear, he certainly is a tiny thing, said Loudwing. He must be a runt. I'll warn you, Roz. Runts usually don't last very long. And with you for a mother, it'll take a miracle for him to survive. I'm sorry, but it's the truth. However, the gosling still deserves a name. Let's see here. Uh, his bill is unusually bright colored. It's actually quite lovely. If I were his mother, I'd call him Bright Bill. But you're his mother, so it's up to you. 
His name will be Brightbill, said Roz as the goose fluttered back to the water. And we will live by this pond where he can be around other geese. I will find us a sturdy tree nearby. You will do no such thing, the goose flapped her wings. A tree is no place for a gosling. Brightbill needs to live on the ground like a normal goose. Loudwing sized up the robot. I suppose you two will need a rather large home. You better speak with Mr. Beaver. He can build anything. He's a little gruff at times, but if you're extra friendly, I'm sure he'll help you out. And if he gives you any trouble, remind him that he owes me a favor. Chapter 29, The Beavers. Every day, the beavers swam along their dam, inspecting and repairing it. The wall of wood and mud allowed only a trickle of water to pass through, and it had turned a narrow stream into a wide pond that many animals now called home. As Roz and Brightbill walked around the pond, they passed hundreds of chewed up tree stumps, proof that the beavers needed a constant supply of wood. And this gave Roz an idea. The robot swung her flattened hand and the sounds of chopping wood echoed across the water. They were soon replaced by the sounds of footsteps and shaking leaves as the robot carefully walked along the beaver dam with a gosling on her shoulder and a freshly cut tree in her hands. The beavers floated beside their lodge and stared at the bizarre sight with open mouths until Mr. Beaver slapped his broad tail on the water, which meant, stop right there. The robot stopped. Hello, beavers. My name is Roz, and this is Brightbill. Please do not be frightened. I am not dangerous. She held out the tree. I have brought you a gift. I thought perhaps you could use this in your beautiful dam. No, thanks said Mr. Beaver. I have a strict policy never to accept gifts from monsters. Don't be ridiculous, interrupted Mrs. Beaver. We can't let a perfectly good birch go to waste. I'm afraid I must insist, said Mr. Beaver. Mrs. Beaver turned to her husband. Remember how you asked me to point out when you're being stubborn and rude? Well, you're being stubborn and rude. Then she turned back to Roz. Thank you, monster. If you'd be so kind as to drop the tree in the water, we'll take it from there. I am not a monster. Roz tossed the tree like a twig. I am a robot. The tree smacked against the water and sent the beavers bobbing up and down. Just then, Brightbill started peeping. Mama! Hungry! So Roz dropped a ball of grass into the nest. The gosling thinks you're his mother? Came a quiet voice. It was Paddler. Mr. and Mrs. Beaver's son. His real mother is dead, said Roz. So I have adopted him. There was a brief silence. Then Paddler looked up to Roz and said, you're a very good robot to take care of Brightbill. Mr. Beaver sighed. Yes, yes, that's very good of you, Roz, but I don't understand what any of this has to do with us. My son and I need a home and Ladwing said you would help us build one. Of course she did. Mr. Beaver muttered to himself. Loudwing gets me out of one lousy jam and I spend the rest of my days doing her favors. Mrs. Beaver glared at her husband. Sorry, he said, realizing he was being stubborn and rude again. Stay right there, Roz. We need to have a family meeting. The three beavers slipped under the water and a moment later their muffled voices could be heard inside the lodge. The robot stood on the dam and patiently waited with her son. Mama! Mama! Yes, Bright Bill, I am trying to act like a good mother. A ripple and a beaver's head appeared above the water. If you bring us four more trees, good, healthy ones, maybe I'll have time to help you and the gosling. That would be wonderful, said the robot. We will be right back. Chapter 30, The Nest. I build my fair share of lodges over the years, Mr. Beaver stood at the water's edge, but I can't say I've ever built one for a robot and a gosling. So just what exactly do you need? We need a lodge big enough for both of us, said Roz. It should be comfortable and safe, and it should be near the pond. How long do you plan on living in this lodge? I do not know. Then we better make it strong and sturdy. Mr. Beaver stroked his whiskers as he thought. Do you plan on having friends over? The missus loves to entertain guests. 
I do not have any friends. No friends? Well, you seem pretty likable for a monster. I mean, I mean robot. But if you want my advice, you should grow yourself a garden. Your neighbors won't be able to resist fresh herbs and berries and flowers. Just you wait and see. So we'll make sure there's a place for a garden and we'll give your lodge some extra space for all the friends we'll be hosting. The beaver winked. We also need to find a way to keep your lodge comfortable when it's cold outside. Our lodge is heated by our own bodies, but I think we'll have to find another way to heat yours. The beaver and the robot thought about heat for a while. The first thing that came to Roz's mind was the sun, but then she remembered the hot sparks she had felt while sliding down the mountain peak. I could heat our lodge with fire, she said. Mr. Beaver blinked his eyes. I will need to experiment, Roz continued, but I think there is a way. You go right ahead, Roz, said the beaver, but would you try not to burn down the entire forest? Do not worry, I will be careful. Let's move on, Mr. Beaver sighed. The next order of business is to find a site for your lodge. That meadow across the water would be perfect, but the hares will have a fit if we try to build there. I think we should clear out some of the trees and build right in the forest. And I know just the place. The beaver took them along the water and up to a dense section of forest that jutted into the pond. It needs some work, said Mr. Beaver, trudging through the thick weeds, but this ought to do the job. Yes, this ought to do the job, said Roz in her friendliest voice. Job, said Bright Bill. Mr. Beaver was incredibly skilled at taking down trees, but even he couldn't keep up with Roz's powerful chopping hands. So he let the robot do the hard work. He pointed out the trees and shrubs that needed to go and Roz started hacking away. By sunset, they were standing in a newly cleared site and they had more than enough wood to build the lodge. You did some fine work here today, Roz, Mr. Beaver yawned. I'll return to the morning and we'll pick up right where we left off. What would you like me to do? Asked the robot. Tonight? So you can still feel like working, do you? Very good. Well, you can start by digging out those tree stumps and you can collect all those large flat stones over there. And you can smooth uh, down this patch of dirt. We'll have it leveled to build. That should keep you busy. The next morning, Mr. Beaver returned to find that Roz had been very busy indeed. All the tree stumps had been dug up and their holes filled with dirt. 20 large stones had been stacked and the ground was now perfectly level. But what most astonished Mr. Beaver was that Roz and Bright Bill were huddled along a small crackling campfire. Mr. Beaver moved his lips, but no words came out. Bright Bill was cold last night, said Roz. So I taught myself how to make a fire. But, but, but how? I discovered that when I strike these two stones together, they create sparks like this. I directed the sparks onto the dry leaves and the wood until they ignited. Once I had a fire, it was easy to keep going. And if I need to put it out, I can just add water. Mr. Beaver sat and warmed his paws. I've never seen a fire in such a neat little bundle. He stared into the flames. I've only seen a blazing through the forest, burning everything in its path, but this is marvelous. He took another minute to enjoy the warmth. Then he and the robot got back to work. Mr. Beaver asked Roz to dig a trench here, to place large stones there, to arrange logs this way, to smear mud that way. Birds and squirrels perched in the trees and watched the new lodge take shape. It resembled the beaver lodge, but it was larger, a great dome of wood and mud and leaves. A simple opening in the wall served as the entrance, and the doors were nothing more than a heavy stone that the robot could slide out of the way. We're going to pause there, class, uh, and we'll finish up this chapter uh, tomorrow.